the English. Thanks, everyone. Once again, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's event on the state of women's rights as human rights in Afghanistan. I'm Milan Brevere, and I direct the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security. Before we begin our conversation, just a word on Russian President Putin's war on Ukraine. As we meet, the catastrophic assault on that country continues with growing numbers of deaths, horrific destruction, more than a million refugees already, with countless more displaced within the country. This is nothing less than a flagrant attack on the independence of Ukraine, on democracy, on freedom. And we continue to stand in solidarity with the people of Ukraine in all the ways we can. Violence and repression in Afghanistan under Taliban rule is increasing with blatant abuses of human rights. Afghan women demonstrating peacefully against the Taliban's disregard of women's rights have been met with violent crackdowns, searches, detention, and imprisonment. Extrajudicial killings, the lack of rule of law, and the suppression of the independent media have become all too common. In countless instances, the Taliban continue to deny women and girls the right to an education, to health care, to employment. Moreover, the gr growing humanitarian crisis is causing starvation and escalating poverty, which has a disproportionate impact on women and girls. We will hear today from some of the foremost Afghan experts and women's rights defenders now living in exile. They are in constant contact with many in Afghanistan and will tell us what they are hearing, as well as offer us recommendations for needed actions that the international community can and must advance. This is the third in a series of conversations on the state of women in Afghanistan under the Taliban and part of our new initiative, Onward for Afghan Women. You can follow our work on onwardforafghanwomen.org. Today's program has simultaneous translation. Please check your interpretation button to make it possible to uh, listen as you'd like. Many in the audience have already pre-submitted questions, but you can also submit additional questions during using the Q&A feature um, on your chat button and uh, just tell us uh, your name and affiliation. And we are joined today by some 600 participants on our Zoom platform uh, and more on the Facebook platform. And now to start our conversation, I'm pleased to turn to my colleague, Ambassador Roya Rahmani, who was a distinguished fellow at the Institute. Roya was the first Afghan female ambassador to the United States. She has had a distinguished career uh, in diplomacy that included serving as ambassador uh, to Indonesia, as well as many positions within her foreign ministry. She's also had positions in other ministries and before entering government, she worked for several nonprofits that primarily focused on women's rights and education. Ambassador, it's wonderful to have you with us. Uh, and I know you have some comments you'd like to make to get us started on this important topic. Thank you so much, Ambassador Vivier. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on wherever you are. And thank you so much, all of you who have tuned into this program for joining us, despite the overwhelming number of issues that begs your attention. Echoing what just Ambassador Vivier already said, I would like to add that today we are talking about human rights and women's rights in Afghanistan when the country is suffering from a severe humanitarian crisis, collapsed economy, dysfunctional bureaucracy, and worse of all, lack of hope. 
But yet the situation has been further exacerbated because Taliban are using fear and intimidation, not only as a primary tool for controlling and suppressing opposing and diverse views, movements and activities, but also in order to maintain their own internal cohesion and in cases, even as a reward system for their forces. They have also demonstrated serious lack of consistency about their policies when it comes to individual rights and liberties. They have issued decrees limiting rights of the citizens, and when faced with massive criticisms, they have reinterpreted them, like the recent announcement about women not being allowed to travel abroad on their own. They have made promises to respect individual rights and dignities, but have violated them in multiple cases, such as preventing music, interfering with citizens' personal choices, and dress code. In other cases, they justify their actions by stating that they had suffered from similar treatment under previous government, like in case of house searches. This would only mean that they are taking revenge from the very people that they are trying to govern. And it will only propagate the cycle of violence. By striking out of Honestone's constitution, keeping justice system ambiguous and arbitrary, and claiming that human rights are a Western construct that does not apply to them, they try to exonerate themselves from their duty to govern responsibly. Similarly, it is not enough for the international community to call for protection of human rights only in their statements in high level conferences and meetings it must be reflected in all their decisions and actions. So what can be done? Just a few quick points. We must acknowledge that the mere focus on humanitarian assistance is not going to be a long-term solution. In fact, it does not even serve as a solution beyond the moment that it's addressing. And instead, creative solutions that are centered around supporting communities through development projects, employment opportunities, and infrastructure development would empower them to seek and safeguard their human rights and enable them to claim them. Second, for international community to improve accountability is to focus on impact, to realistically apply cost benefit analysis to what they are funding and its sustainability especially with the huge emphasis on humanitarian assistance. Third, investing in infrastructure and private sector is not investing in Taliban and their government, but it is investing in Afghanistan, in global security and in human rights, allowing people to think beyond survival and empowering them to claim their rightful agency to make their own choices is fundamental to justice and upholding human rights. Fourth, we should not continue to lower the bar for protection and respect for human rights and particularly women's rights to adjust for the situation. It sets a very dangerous precedence and will take generations to be remedied. Lastly, it is important, even if it feels difficult to not look at Afghanistan as a lost cause. There are millions of people there living with aspiration for better life and future and with unmatched resilience. We need to hold that as a source of hope because when there is hope, there is well, and when there is well, there is a way. And finally, we know that need is overwhelmingly massive. Criticism, easy, and solutions, scarce. In a situation like this, it is a must to listen and incorporate views of those who have the highest stake in the situation, the Afghan people. And with that, let's listen to a distinguished panel of Afghans and experts that have deservingly earned that title. Over to you, Ambassador. Well, thank you so much, Ambassador Rahmani, for those inspirational words, uh, for setting the context for this discussion and for really getting us started on some of the recommended actions we should all be taking. <clears throat> so thank you for that. 
We are now pleased to uh, welcome Hoda Kamosh, a women's rights activist and journalist who recently was one of the women representatives of Afghan civil society at the Oslo summit on Afghanistan. There she called for the release of unjustly arrested female prisoners and urged the international community to pressure the Taliban to support women's rights and human rights. In the past, she has led public campaigns to raise awareness on women's health and was recognized on the BBC's list of 100 inspiring and influential women in 2021. She's also worked as a journalist and when the Taliban ceased power, she continued to participate in demonstrations for women's rights to education and their participation in politics. Pada, it's wonderful to have you with us today. And I wanna throw out several questions to you. Uh, first of all, what are you hearing on the ground from your fellow Afghan women activists? Uh, what is happening there? What kinds of threats are women facing, are minorities facing? And then tell us a little bit about what happened to you when you stood up to the Taliban in Oslo. And in the interest of time, but still we need to hear some of your recommendations, particularly bringing in those from those who've been detained and abused. What are they recommending to the international community uh, for our actions? So please. من سلام می فرستم به همه عزیزانی که در اینجا حضور دارن و از سپاسگزار هستم از اینکه فرصت مناسبی هست که بتونیم صدای زنان افغانستان به جامعه افغانستان و به گوش جهان برسانیم پاسخ به سوال شما این است که ما هر باری که خب ما گروه های تشکیل داده بودیم و در این گروه ها حضور داریم و نگرانی زنها را می بینیم چی از ولایات چی از کابل که ایده از خانم ها چشم دیدای خود در اینجا در میان میگذارند و همه زنان بعد از اینکه ایده ای از زنان معترس در زندان طالبان به سارت به سر بردن حراس گرفتن و ترس گرفتن و می ترس از از اینکه چی بر سر اونا خواهد آمد و ما در یک جامعه سنتی زندگی می کنیم در یک جامعه که برای زن حق حق یعنی بر زن حق نمی داد تا اینکه یک ایده ای از زن ها با تلاش و با پشت کار به جامعه رونق گرفتن و این کمتر کسایی هستن که ما می بینیم شان و از اونا می خانیم و از اونا می و ما دیدیم که تا اونا در رس سیاست را پیدا کردن اما بعد از اینکه طالبان به افغانستان آمدن شما دیدین که خیلی البته کلی اگر صحبت بکنم بسیار وحشتناک در کابل همه به سر می بردن و همه پنهان شده بودن ایده ای هم نیاز شد که بیرون از افغانستان برن اما یک ایده ای زنان که در افغانستان موندن دیگر برایشان سخت بود که تسلیم شوند و اونا با چشم سر ببینن که حقوقشان بعد از 20 سال که به دست آورده بودن از اونا گرفته شدن با حضور طالبان خب ما متوجه این بودیم که در مکاتب بسته شد در آموزشگاه ها بسته شد و بعد از اینکه اعلان کابینه شد ما دیدیم که زنها از سیاست هم حذف شدن ما انتظار داشتیم از طالبان که با همون روی کردی که آمدن با همون دیدی که آمدن برای خودشان برنامه ای داشته باشن برای مردم افغانستان برنامه ای داشته باشن تا بتانن با مردم افغانستان کنار بیان امروز ما فساد اداری گذشته را ایجاد میکنیم اما نه تنها این فساد که از یک ملت از بین برد و ایده ای در جانشینیش هستیست که از دست داد اما باز هم با این هنوز طالبان نتانستن در این شش ماه فرصت فرصتی که به اینا داده شد با مردم تعامل بکنن و دولت و حکومت با مردم ساخته میشه که هنوز اینا مشروعیت از مردم نگرفتن ما زنانی هم داشتیم که برای نان کار آزادی و برای اینکه بتانیم حق خود داشته باشیم اعتراض کردیم و با این هم ما 
پاسخ جدی از طالب طالبان گرفتیم واکنش گرفتیم شکر برکی گاز اشکاور لاتوکو و حتی زنانی هم هستن که این 29 زن و 4 زنی که در اوایل در بند طالبان قرار گرفت امروز شکنجه و تجاوز با اونا سر افتاد ما زنانی داریم در مزار شریف که بعد از اینکه تظاهرات 7 و 8 دسامبر صورت گرفت اونا در بند قرار گرفتن و با اونا تجاوز شد و ایده ای از این دخترا از طریق خانواده هایشان کشته شدن و ایده ای هم همینطوری مرده هایشان رو پیدا کردن و یکیشان واضح و آشکار است که فروزان, فروزان بود و حنیفه احمد احمدی بود که طالبان بعد از آزادی غیر مستقیم اینا را به گلوله بستند اما جنبش ها که یکی در یک از این جنبش ها ما هستم و برنامه های ما را به صورت خلاصه داریم به طرح برنامه های ما را به شکل دیگری داریم برنامه ریزی میکنیم مثلا کارزارهایی که در این چند روز پیش ما را اندازی کردیم که دستت را به من بده و کارزاری که در ماه مارچ داریم برنامه ریزی میکنیم اما تظاهرات و این که بتانیم دوباره به خیابان بریم برای خیلی از زنان سخت شده چون اینا نه تنها بعد از اصارت کشیدن زنان در بند که خانواده های مایتشان میکرد همسرها های مایتشان میکرد امروزه هیچ کسی مایتشان نمیکنند پسی برای یک زن سخت است و من یکی از میان او وسط بلند شدم و با دعوت از طرف سازمان ملل به ناروی دعوت شدم اینجا آمدم من خیلی آشکار و واضح دیدم که طالبان چقدر برای مشروعیت گرفتنشان بله های زیادی میگویند و, و هر باری که سران حکومت از اینا میخواست که در به مقاطع رو باز کنین با مردم تعامل بکنین با مردم سازگاری بکنین اینا بله میگفتن و ما امروز شاهد هستیم که چقدر جنایت های, جنایت جنایت های بشری را در افغانستان مخصوصا در سایر ولایات اینا دست میزنند و نظامی ها را و ایده ای از مردم را به ناحق و بهانه های زیادی سرکوب میکنند میکشند و غرورشان را میشکنند یکی از اینا همی بسوسی های خانه به خانه هست که با بی حرمتی وارد این مسئله می شوند و چیزی که در اسلو گفتن پیامی که در اسلو داشتن پیامی که در سخنهایشان در اینجا بود کلا پرت می کنن وقتی در مذاکره قرار می گیرن و بعد از اون به مرکز سیاست خود می رن که افغانستان فعلا شده چیز یعنی بسیار فرق میکنن اینا بله های زیادی میگن تا بتانن مشروعیت بگیرن اما مهم این است که اینا چقدر پایبند حرفای خودشان هستند و چقدر ایره جامعه عمل میپوشانند ما واقعا به حیث یک فعال وقتی در اسلو در مقابل اینا قرار گرفتم و اونا پاسخی که البته ما پاسخ درستی نگرفتم چون هر ما برای آزادی زنان اینجا برای مذاکره نیامده بودم ما آمده بودم که مطالب مطالبات زنان افغانستانی که در اونجا تنین صداهایشان در کابل میپیچه در اسلو برسانم و اینجا وقتی ما گفتم اگر شما واقعا میخواین آزادی زنها را و برابری زنها را در یک جامعه داشته باشین خب کوچکترین کاری است که همین دو شب قبل تمنا و پروانه را شما گرفتین اون را آزاد بکنین و به سراحت رد کردن که هیچ زنی در بند اسارت طالبان در بند طالبان قرار نداره و هیچ کسی شکنجه نمیشه با وجود که امروز با ویدیوی منتشر شده 13 دقیقه شان ثابت میکنن که بله دختران زیادی در اسارت اینا هست و اینا نه تنها به اسارت میکشن که بیرحمانه به صورت و موتر و به خانه ها حجوم میبرن و قتل جنایت میکنن ما از از این که در این برنامه دعوت شدم میخوام پیام واضحی را برسانم که واقعا اگر طالبان مشروعیت بگیرن بیاین چشمای خود ببندیم که چه خیانتی برای طالبان از دست طالبان و مردم افغانستان رخ میده 
و ایران امروز اگر اونا آشکارا دست به جنایت میزنن اما شما میبینید که به طور مرموز چه اتفاق های بشرناکی در کابل رو میدن پس بیاییم فرصت بدیم بیاییم حق بدیم به طالبان تا به کارهایشون عملی نکرده به سخنهایشون جامعه عمل نپوشنده اونا رو به رسمیت نشناسیم و به اونا اجازه بدیم که واقعا خودشان رو ثابت بکنن وقتی میگوین که ما تا تغییر کردیم و ما می توانیم با مردم و دولتداری دولتداری بکنیم برای مردم این جمع اسنادی داشتم یعنی چند نقطه داشتم که شرایط مردم هرچ می کنم ما می خواهیم که در این اواخر درست از طالبان شاید نسا در به مکاتب برای زنان و مردان باز بکنه دانشگاه ها باز شده اما حراس ما، حراس کسانی که در دانشگاه ها درس میدن اساتید هست و کسانی که در ریاست های معرف هست ترسشان از این است که نصاب تعلیمی زیر سلطه طالبان نباشه شاید پیام های از دانشگاه رنا، از دانشگاه خورشید، از سایر دانشگاه های خصوصی میرسه که اینا دارن نصاب تعلیمی را حس میکنن مثلا مزامین چون فیزی، کیمیا، انگلیسی، ریاضی این مزامین حس میکنن و به جایش بعض مزامینی که خودشان دارن روی و برنامه ریزی میکنن مثل آموزش هجاب، آموزش یعنی نصاب اسلامی بعض موارد دیگری در دارن در نصاب تعلیمی جاگوزی میکنه که این وحشتناک و این میتونه در ذهن کسی که در اونجا قرار داره و اونجا آموزش میبینه به عنوان یک تروریست در بشه یک کودکی که از کودکی از در ذهنش همچی یک واجه های قرار بگیره و همچی یک عمل های قرار بگیره پس, پس جهان باید از نسل آینده افغانستان بترسه که وقتی که این گروه ها دارن در نظام آموزشی این عمل کردار را پیاده میکنن یک،, یک کشور زیر بنای مکان تروریستی برای جهان و برای مردم خودش میشه و من نگران این هستم تا بتانیم بتانه طالبان خود از ثابت بکنن که اینا مخالفین خود میکشن خبرنگارا را میکشن کسانی که بر زیرشان یا حد اقل بر سخن اونا رایت نمیکنن اونا را سر میبرن به گلوله میبندن من میخوایم جهان به جای این که با گوشش بشنوه به گوشش پنبه بگذاره و با چشمش برای جهان, جهان برای افغانستان باز کنه و بنگره گزارش ببینه تا ببینه که واقعا چه جنایت بشری در افغانستان رو میده سپاس گذار هستم Well, thank you so much, Hoda. And I'm reminded listening to you of the saying, uh, watch what they do, not what they say. Uh, and thank you for that snapshot of real time um, actions, terrible actions that the Taliban are taking uh, that the world may not be seeing. So thank you for that. We are going to turn now to Najiba Ayubi. She's an award-winning journalist and activist for human rights and freedom of the press. Najiba has been threatened and attacked for her reporting on politics and women's rights. As managing director of the Gillig Group, she led a team of reporters who reached millions of uh, readers and listeners uh, and have refused calls for censorship. She's the founder of the Afghan Independent Media Consortium and the Freedom of Expression Initiative. Among other awards, she received the International Women's Media Foundation Courage in Journalism Award. Najiba, we're so happy to have you with us today. Um, and I'm wondering, because we've heard about the crackdown on the media by the Taliban, I wonder what you can tell us about what you're hearing uh, from journalists on the ground in Afghanistan about their challenges, their threats, uh, particularly uh, with respect to the women, uh, and, and certainly what can be done? Uh, what can the international community be doing to address this? Uh, so, Najiba. 
thank you very much, uh, uh, Ms. Ambassador, and uh, my uh, regards to all colleagues present here, to uh, Hoda John, Ms. Rahmani, Ms. Wadak, and all of other uh, colleagues here. I'm very happy to be here, and thanks for providing this opportunity for us to be together and talk with the audience and also see each other. Uh, let me to say what we had before 15 August regarding the media, because I wanted to I want to consider on uh, media and freedom expression and free freedom of the media. Uh, to whom they uh, have to know uh, freedom of expression and also women, especially women media, uh, have a history of one, more than 100 years in Afghanistan. Because in, two, uh, in 1921, we had a special uh, newspaper for women, which was uh, Irshad Aswan. It means the women of Afghanistan started one century before to work on the media. Before 15 of August, uh, we had a golden time. I want to consider the 20 years, last 20 years, because with the uh, support of international community, we established under its media in Afghanistan, we also established, uh, we had also access to information law, we had media law, which was the very good one, and also the access to information law was recognized as a, uh, uh, the best uh, law in the world. And also we had too many mechanisms, we had unions, we had uh, different organization, they defend the media and freedom of expression. We had a uh, high uh, media council, we had commissions considering all this uh, system was considering the uh, freedom of expression and also uh, media support. Uh, in this industry, we had 2,000 uh, colleague work, men and women, as a journalist, the producers, and also media workers. We had 2,000 more than more or less 2,000 women work in this industry. But after um, 15 of August, we lost everything in, in two, three hours. It was very painful for me as a uh, freedom of expression defender in Afghanistan, which I spent my more than two decades life in defending human rights and freedom of expression and human rights in Afghanistan, it was very, very painful and difficult. We lost everything. And that's why I lost trust on human rights, I, on democracy, on everything. I, I think uh, all these very good and fashionable words can be changed in minutes if it is in benefit of the powerful people around the world. And it is a very bad and uh, painful part of the history. Uh, when the, the power fell down in the hand of Taliban, uh, more than 300 uh, media was closed. 6,400 journalists and media workers left the country. 50% of uh, journalists uh, lost their jobs. 80% of uh, women journalists lost their job. The censorship increased. The censor we have two kinds of censorship now. As I am in contact with uh, my colleagues in my this uh, industry in Afghanistan, uh, there is two, two kinds of uh, censorship. One is the censorship which is applying from Taliban, and the other censorship is uh, the media itself doing the censorship. Again, the, the, the journalists as well, because they, we lost all the mechanism that they protected the journalism, that the system fell down, and we don't have anything, anything right now. Uh, beside of all these things, media facing a lot of uh, security uh, uh, challenges, and also uh, financial uh, difficulties. We, uh, as I mentioned, we had that much uh, achievement during 20 years. It was not easy to reach to all these achievements and success, uh, successes because we lost 170 journalists. They lost their life 
It was not easy. We didn't uh, reach to these things uh, very easy. But uh, now uh, this very uh, difficult uh, situation, the, the Taliban representatives even going to the media houses they are going to the newsrooms and they are contacting the producers, the moderators of the roundtables and the reporters. And they are also influencing to about the choosing the topics and choosing the guests, the guest speakers, which is uh, which we don't had this experience during the last regime. We didn't give them uh, this right to come to our newsroom without our permission. If we didn't invite them, they had no permission to come, even the very high level people in the government. But right now, which the, the situation for Afghan media get that much change, and we have a lot of censorship, and we have a lot of things, negative things happening around the country, and nobody can bring it to the media because there is a lot of trades on the ground. Uh, and also from the other side, we lost a lot of talented and experienced journalists because they went outside of the country. Some of them left the jobs, even if they are in the country, they left, they, they, they left the media houses because they can't uh, report the realities. And that is why they are feeling very bad. And that's why they resigned. Uh, my two, three colleagues resigned the very good editors. And I asked why they said we can't uh broadcast something which is the reality in the ground is other thing it means a lot then uh, my recommendation uh, right now for uh, current situation in afghanistan is there is a lot of things happen and uh, afghan media is not uh, able to because of the reasons which I mentioned before, they are not able to cover these issues because the sensitivities which is uh, in the ground. Uh, I, we, Afghan journalists, uh, expect from the other media around the world, which they have access, they have reporters, they have, uh, they can get information from the uh, ground. They have to consider and and cover. The, the issues, the topics, which the Afghan media is not able to do. Uh, the other thing is uh, keeping and building the, the trust because the Afghan media uh, among themselves, they lost the, the, the trust and the, some hands tried to broke the trust among the journalists and media uh, organizations and supporters and also federation and the other things. Uh, the third uh, recommendation, uh, my suggestion is to international community, they have to or they must uh, support Afghan media because they facing uh, the media which they are working in Afghanistan because they face a lot of financial difficulties and we lost 30, 43% of the media is closed now. If they didn't get some, um, don't get some um, financial support, the other media also will be closed down, and it is very difficult for Afghan people to lose the only thing that they are trusting uh, on on the ground. And the uh, fourth thing is that the fourth, suge fourth suggestion uh, to the decision makers and the influencers. They have to push Taliban to accept human rights, freedom exp expression, and freedom of the press, because they are not familiar with these uh, these words uh, actually, and with these values. These values have to be uh, keep kept, and also uh, push Taliban to accept these things. And uh, the last uh, suggestion is providing the training for the new journalists which they are uh, joining the media because they need training during the 20 years we had a lot of trainings now 6400 uh, talented reporters and experienced reporters left afghanistan and the one they knew uh, joined the, the media houses they need some uh, professional trainings which i suggest to international community, especially the organization that uh, this is their mandate to provide some opportunities for them. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you so much, Najiba. Thank you for those good suggestions. And you know, I'm listening to you and I'm thinking back to a trip I made in Afghanistan uh, where I met with a large group of women journalists and they gave me a little bouquet of flowers and they said that there was an Afghan uh, poem that said that one flower does not make spring, but many flowers do. Yes. And they were referring to the, to the flourishing of media in Afghanistan that they represented uh, and many like them. And listening to you and, and hearing what's happening today uh, makes me think that that springtime has turned into a dark winter. Uh, yes. And I hope that that can change again back. Uh, so thank you for your comments and thank you for being with us. And we'll get more questions during the Q&A. Thank you. Uh, we're going to turn now to uh, Svajmai Wardak, uh, the former Deputy Technical Minister of the Afghan Ministry of Women's Affairs. In her position, she championed women's economic empowerment, anti-harassment programs, justice, and more. Earlier, she worked with Save the Children for nearly a decade leading efforts to provide education and establish schools for girls and collaborate it with civil society organizations and other institutions like USAID to advance women's rights. She is coming to us from Albania uh, where she is continuing to speak out against the violence being perpetrated against women and girls in Afghanistan. Spush, my welcome to you. Um, I know you were having some technical difficulties earlier. Uh, so if we don't see your face, uh, we will know why, but we hope that you'll be coming through loud and clear. Um, let me ask you about what challenges there are today uh, running shelters to keep women safe. We know how important women's shelters have always been. Uh, what is happening today? Uh, what are the women telling you as you're staying in very close touch with them. And then what do the shelters need and how should we provide support, we in the international community please. in ways that are effective? So Spush, my please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first, hi uh, to respectful ambassador all uh, audience and I'm very pleasure to see the Afghan strong woman like uh, Ayubi Saib Hoda, Hoda Jan Rahmani Saib. I'm pleasure uh, and uh, uh, thanks for all of you organizing this uh, opportunity. <laughs> First, let me thank Georgetown University for their initiative to organize this very useful panel discussion that will support Afghan women by the advantage Looks like we are having a repeat of those technical difficulties. Can someone tell me if the connectivity is being restored? Malam, we're working on it. Let's go to our next speaker while we're waiting for her to restore. Okay. Um, we will now turn uh, to a non-Afghan on our panel, uh, but a very strong voice for Afghan women and girls. Heather Barr is the Associate Director of the Women's Rights Division at Human Rights Watch. Uh, she's researched human rights in a number of countries. She's an expert on these issues um, like girls' education, access to healthcare, violence against women, child marriage, human trafficking, and so many other abuses uh, that affect our world. Earlier, she worked for the United Nations on human rights and legal reform, as well as working with a New York shelter for the homeless. So Heather, it's so great to have you with us uh, because you have been quoted repeatedly and are very aware of many of the uh, abuses we're discussing today, um, particularly toward women activists in Afghanistan. I wonder what observations you can give us from the reports uh, that you've been getting. Um, has the response from the international community been adequate? 
uh, what is needed for greater accountability and monitoring of human rights. This is a very big discussion today. Uh, we know it's not happening as it should, which is one of the reasons uh, we're doing uh, this program. Um, and what, if anything, can be done with the UNAMA mandate renewal that will be coming up in the United Nations to focus on um, human rights monitoring. So Heather, if you can please. Thank you. Um, thanks so much. It's, um, it's such an honor to um, join such a, a group of powerful women. So thanks so much for inviting me. Um, <clears throat> so other speakers have talked about some of the extreme and brutal ways that um, the Taliban have been violating women's rights. And, and at Human Rights Watch, we've been tracking this quite closely. Um, and, and as others have said, it, it's, been, it's been overwhelming. It's affected every aspect of the, the lives of women and girls. Um, they've really seen their, their dreams and their futures um, sort of crushed and, and, and ripped away from them overnight. So education, employment, access to health care, um, ability to live free from gender-based violence, um, political voice, freedom of movement, freedom of expression, all of these things. Um, are, are largely gone for women and girls um, because of policies implemented by the Taliban. And so I, I wanted to take one moment um, just, to, just to really acknowledge the, the extraordinary bravery of the protesters um, like Hoda and others um, who come out on the streets over and over again from the very first days um, after the Taliban returned to, to um, to demand their rights. And, um, you know, their protests have been effective in, in sort of capturing the world's imagination and, and attention at a moment when, um, you know, the international media has largely looked away from Afghanistan. And, and I think it's because they've been so effective um, that they've become a real thorn in the side of the Taliban. And, and the Taliban has now um, you know, decided to silence them at any cost. And as you said, Ambassador Revere, beatings, threats, pepper spray, house raids, abduction, coerced confessions, um, you know, these are all tactics that the Taliban has used against um, a few women standing peacefully on a sidewalk asking, um, asking to have their rights back. Um, so thank you for the invitation to, to talk about the international response um, to these abuses. Um, I, I don't think it's been very good, to be honest, and uh, I'll be a little bit brutal, and I'll say that I, I think that the United States is mostly to blame for that. Um, I think there's been a real lack of any sense of urgency um, from the international community, and particularly from the White House, um, about how to resolve this situation, how to respond to this situation. There doesn't seem to be very much coordination between the United States and other countries about how to put pressure on the Taliban over the violations of women's rights that, that are happening. Um, and, um, you know, it's uh, one of the things that I think has been really frustrating is that every time um, President Biden talks about Afghanistan, you have this feeling that he's, he's somehow angry, not necessarily at the Taliban, but at Afghans, and, and that he doesn't want to hear about it anymore. And, and I think it's been especially painful in the last week for Afghans to, to see the, the contrast between um, this kind of disinterest and, and apathy um, compared with, you know, this very kind of focused response um, to the, the tragedies that are unfolding in Ukraine. Um, I think it's, it's understandable for US politicians and, and politicians in other countries to have a, a feeling of shame about the way that events have unfolded in Afghanistan and especially how catastrophic this has been for Afghan women and girls. But that shame should drive a sense of responsibility, um, not a desire to forget. Um, you know, I remember I was living in New York on 9-11 and I remember how we were told that um, the, the invasion of Afghanistan was necessary to, to go and deliver Afghan women from the Taliban. Now, of course, we know that, you know, that was, a <laughs> things were much more complicated than that, but I think that still creates an obligation um, to Afghan women and, and that obligation has not been met. 
Um, we have to also talk about the fact that US decisions have driven the humanitarian crisis, um, which is unfolding and deepening in Afghanistan, where children are, are actually starving to death virtually every day because of US policies, including um, withdrawing recognition of the central bank. Um, so this is also a women's rights crisis. Um, the humanitarian crisis is, is disproportionately affecting women and girls. You know, one of the most horrifying aspects of it is, is reading about um, people selling their children to, to try to feed themselves. And, and you can't help but notice that the children being sold are pretty much always girls. Um, so, so, you know, this is a way in which decisions by the international community are actually adding to the harm <clears throat> that women and girls are experiencing. So, so I have three recommendations for the United States. Um, the first one is that the US has to unlock the Afghan economy. They have to let the economy function. Humanitarian assistance, sacks of flour, bottles of oil is never going to replace a functioning economy. People have to be able to work go to work, get a salary, and, and feed their families themselves. Um, the second, second recommendation is um, the US needs to fo focus urgently on, um, on pressuring the Taliban on human rights abuses and on doing so in a, in a coordinated way with as many other countries as possible. And it shouldn't be too hard to find common ground with other countries. I think it's, it's notable that countries including Qatar and Pakistan have condemned the Taliban's decision to deny girls access to secondary education. Um, putting pressure on the Taliban is hard, we know that, but, but we also know that it's not impossible. Um, you know, we see them um, you know, sort of seem a bit shamefaced and, and issue denials or walk back from um, abusive policies that they've, they've issued when there is um, pressure from the international community and an outcry, we saw that this week. Um, even, you know, with them kind of scrambling to, to clarify their statement about people being blocked from leaving the country. So the, the international engagement, the international pressure is meaningful, is important. And there's a lot of space to strategize about how you create incentives through delivering aid. Um, other panelists have had some good ideas about how you can support sort of essential civil society um, groups and, and um, functions that, that do still exist, people who are still there trying to do their work but, but need support. Um, and then the third thing is um, that the, the US needs to push really hard for an effective UN response in Afghanistan. And, and you referred to this, Ambassador Verveer. There are two crucial decisions that are coming up this month from the United Nations. Um, one is, as you said, on the, the renewal of the mandate of the United Nations assistance mission in Afghanistan. Um, and, and this looks like it, it could be complicated and contested and we need um, the US and other countries that care about women's rights to be putting a lot of political muscle into, into fighting to preserve that mandate, make sure that there's a very strong mandate for the mission to be monitoring the human rights situation, including the women's rights situation, including the, the treatment of protesters, um, including access to education, access to healthcare for women, all of these things and, and reporting publicly. So we, we need to make sure that they have that mandate, that they have the staffing they need, they have the, the resources they need, the political backing they need, they have a bit of pressure on them as well when that's necessary to, to really um, sort of open up this, this kind of space that we have right now where we really have very little idea what's going on on the ground. Um, and then the other, the second important decision that's coming from the UN this month is the appointment of a special rapporteur on human rights in Afghanistan. Um, and that's going to be an important complement to the, to the mission. Um, we need them to, to be working together and we need the special rapporteur also to have the resources and staffing um, and backing necessary to, to really um, hold the Taliban to account and let us know what's happening. Um, and that person needs to have a, a ton of expertise on their team to, to focus on women's rights, including um, some experts who are Afghan women. Thanks very much. Well, thank you so much, Heather, and particularly for mentioning uh, why the UNAMA mandate uh, renewal is, is uh, important and 
the fact that a lot of work needs to be done to get it to a better place, uh, as well as the special rapporteur that will be named for the Human Rights Council. These are really important when it comes uh, also to monitoring the human rights situation in Afghanistan. Um, I'm also grateful that you mentioned the collapse of the banking system because uh, we often don't focus on that, but, but many in the Afghan community, particularly many of the women we're working with, understand just how serious that is because all the humanitarian aid in the world uh, will not make that kind of difference if the banking system collapses and the economy totally collapses. So these are really critical issues that you've raised. And I'm always struck that when, when things are off the front pages, we tend to forget what's really happening. And sometimes what's happening is a lot worse. Uh, so, so thank you for those reminders. We're gonna try to get back now to Albania and hope that we can um, have Spajma Warduk with us loud and clear. Spajma, are you there? Okay. Yes, I'm, I'm here. Uh, sorry for the problems. Maybe you can go into telling us what you're hearing from the ground about the safety of women, the safety of the shelters, um, and then some recommendations as to what more we should all be doing. Okay. First, let me thank Georgetown University for their initiative to organize this very useful panel discussion that will support Afghan women by advancing effective policy and programs. I hope our ideas, suggestions, and recommendations they represent the truth on the ground when we realize the goals of session. According to answer for your question, currently Afghan women are experiencing different kinds of treats and suffering from a lack of access to education, employment, movement, etc. For those who had a job and were attending the university, they are now stuck at home, which for many feels like jail. Their human rights and civil rights have been seriously curtailed, and most of them are now under direct threat from the Taliban. They are also facing security threats because there is no guarantees of protection from the government. Their lives are in danger and money are in prison. Unfortunately, that's the reality nowadays in Afghanistan. Women are also experiencing social insecurity, which include illegal arrests, and la lack of justice because the courts of under the Taliban influence and also all the staff in the courts are male. I believe that the existing international pressure on the Taliban has not been effective if enough because it has not pre pursued enough protection for special vulnerable groups, including women human rights defenders. Furthermore, as most incidents are censored before they reach the international community, they are before hard to act upon. There have been some demonstrations by women's groups but the Taliban have raked her down on them. Those women now have nowhere to go and face to violent threats against them. To ensure safety for those women, my top recommendation is that international community must advocate for women's protection centers that are the, the adequately resourced and, and backed up by the go government, as happened before the fall of COVID. 
Well, money is one thing with money government and non-government share organization before the fall of Kabul. I know that women have always needed a safe place to go. And that holistic women's protection centers overseen by the Ministry of Women Affairs have been effective solutions. In addition to providing safety, they provide access to education, vocational training, and psychological support so that the women are self-sufficient when they leave. The shelters designed before Taliban operating were not in a effective giving. This is because, regardless of international policies, financing number of staff with the little experience and other support to women centers. So the Taliban state do not support them. I have also seen issue with some local angels reporting without accurate information about the budget, which reflects some problem of corruption. A sustainable solution must include government by end. While there are new challenges, not least the Ministry of Women Affairs has been renamed to the Ministry of Prohibition of the News or Voice and Virtue. The international community can still advocate for Ari's G source and connection ministry that can oversee the distribute finding to these centers, funding to these centers. This should be ultimate goal. In addition to women's centers, I have the following recommendation for the international community on ensuring women's rights in Afghanistan. Number one, use the leverage of Muslim majority country and religion, uh, regional uh, Islamic power to convince the Taliban that women's rights are consistent with Islam and to amend this strict religious laws in Afghanistan. Number two, advocate for global support to be directed Directed were vulnerable groups, especially women and children in Afghanistan. Number three, recognize Afghanistan's commitment to UN Security Resolution 1325 and pledge to respect Afghan women's important role to the peace and security. If the Taliban want to be seen as a legit, legitimate governing body, they must upload Afghanistan commitments to international human rights conventions. Number four, the connection between women's economic empowerment and violence against women. Donors should design programs to improve women's economic opportunity and competency because economically empowerment women are less likely to face punishment har harassment from their families and communities. Number five. Established institutions designed to support and advance women's rights, like the Directorate of Women Affairs in each Afghanistan province. Of the knowledge, expertise of people who have worked 
on successful women shelters in the Muslim countries to, to share best practice and listen, lessons learned. The other recommendation, give you policies and documents from past women protection centers to ensure any new policies, codes and standards, and monitoring and evaluation frameworks or adapt to different group of people, including women, men, police, relevant government authorities, district representatives, and religious leaders. There are the recommendation women centers should be designed to address different kinds of case, include violence against women, domestic violence, and IPV, and also anti-mediation or harassment of women's rights defenders and journalists. These, these symbols should, should also be a place of women to learn and improve their knowledge and skills. These are all the recommendations I share with you. Again, I'm sorry for the uh, weak connection because of some technical issue. Well, Spajmai, thank you so much. I, I think you have many good recommendations in that list, and I particularly want to underscore uh, the issue of uh, the fact that women's rights are not inconsistent with Islam and your call on other predominantly Muslim countries, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and leaders in those countries and the women's community uh, to unite in getting that across to the Taliban. And also your connection of economic empowerment uh, with decreases in violence against women there has to be much more attention to uh, empowering women again uh, in jobs uh, so that they can have the livelihoods and the income that they need, uh, not only for themselves and their families, but also to be kept from being violated. So thank you for that. And now we're gonna turn to our audience questions. Uh, and Ali, I'm gonna turn to you. <coughs> we'll start with one pulling on the thread of, of the role of regional states. Um, asking how can Muslim majority countries be most effective in convincing the Taliban that women's rights are consistent with Islam? How can they most effectively leverage their community and how can the broader international community support this? Perhaps Ambassador Rahmani, we can start with you. Certainly, thank you, Ali. Um, about the regional engagement, what I would like to say is that uh, so long as the regional political lens towards Afghanistan has not changed, uh, and which uh, so far has served as a major underlying factor uh, to the continuation of violence uh, over an instability, an instability over decades, the situation uh, may not change. And how to change that lens is to take for the regional powers, for the regional countries, is to take a long-term view in their own politics and look at Afghanistan beyond a buffer zone or a backyard where they want to take their unwanted troubles, which has been the case over the past decades. So instead, if they were to widen their vision beyond their political terms, and concentrate on regional economic development, social development, and connectivity. There is much to share and much to learn and exchange. It should not be, in fact, this is not only for the regional countries, but for, uh, for the wider international community, that if they stop looking at Afghanistan, uh, either as a security situation or a charity case, then this is when we are going to move to the right direction. In terms of the exchanges uh, about the practices, the rights of women, uh, understanding of Islam, I would say once we move beyond many of these other hurdles, then that would naturally come. Because right now what we see, uh, I don't really necessarily believe that it's a question of 
being Islamic or not, because one group is, has come and has provided the most severe and once, uh, I, I would say, uh, not even comprehensive uh, interpretation or their own understanding of the religion and expect everybody else to follow through. I, I just see it as simply as a political instrument and tool. And that would change once the rest could follow. Very good point. Does anybody else want to weigh in on that? Otherwise, we'll move to the next question. Sure. Next question here is on uh, access to justice and rule of law right now, asking what does justice look like in Afghanistan and who is responsible for ensuring justice for human rights violations? And how can civil society and the international community uh, best support efforts to establish rule of law in any way under the current constraints? Any recommendations uh, taking that up? Heather, do you want to weigh in on that? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's very little rule of law um, or very little that feels like rule of law to people in Afghanistan now. I mean, of course, you know, the police were seen by the Taliban as, as their enemy because, you know, they were actively involved in um, military operations um, on behalf of the previous government. And so the police have largely been dismantled. And people that we talk to talk a lot about feeling like there's no one to call. Um, you know, if, if you were the victim of a crime um, and these house searches that the Taliban has been conducting in the last week or so have, have really terrorized um, people who feel that they um, are in the are in the sights of the government. You know, some people, some people don't seem to have mind the house searches, but those are people who I think don't have reasons to, to fear the Taliban, don't have reasons to fear retaliation um, because of their affiliations in the past with the, the previous government or with international organizations. Whereas those who, who were already frightened are, are much more so now that these House searches are going on and, and going on sometimes in, in quite an abusive way. So, so when the, the government or that when the administration that's supposed to be providing rule of law and, and justice is engaging in, in that kind of abuse, then you feel very, very unsafe. In terms of what the international community can do, I mean, it's it's very difficult right now to think of, of what can be done except for, you know, except for the kind of pressure that we've talked about already. This is not a capacity building or technical assistance problem. This is a, an issue about, um, you know, are the Taliban going to try to be a legitimate government that provides rule of law, or are they going to continue to, to just find it more, most efficient to rule by fear? Thanks. Thank you. Allie? Sure, this question is, is saying, it seems the Taliban may be promoting false progress by making large gestures like opening up a uh, girl's education. How can we ensure that they continue to go further on other human rights, uh, such as freedom of speech and press, women's political participation and leadership and access to justice? Najiba, do you wanna come in on that? You're, you're muted. Actually, the Taliban uh, tr trying to uh, find a way and, and ensure themselves like they are respecting human uh, rights and uh, especially women rights. But the reality in the ground is very different. They can't uh, accept few women which they come on the street and ask for their right, which is work, food, and, and their freedom. They can't accept it. You see in the, in the past, they put them in the jail. As uh, Hoda John mentioned before, uh, all these things which they are announcing that we will provide education for women uh, and girls, uh, it is, it, they, they just want to show themselves that uh, uh, they are like this. But the reality in the ground is very different. You saw that, that uh, experience of uh, keeping these people in the jail. And uh, this shows that uh, they just want to do this and say this 
to be recognized by the, the other countries. When they recognize by other countries, maybe the, the, the things uh, get a lot of change negatively. Uh, my, I believe like that. But uh, let's to see when they want to start the schools in the spring, they, they said after maybe a few days, few weeks, they will start the, the as they promised, they will start the, the school for the girls over the uh, sex uh, grade. We will see what will happen on the, what they are teaching in the school. It is very important because the only going and coming from school is not important. The content and the curriculum is very important, which we had difficulties during past regime as well. But still that uh, problems is on the floor. If they uh, train them like uh, something which they, they, they kill the, the every belief on humanity, on human rights and for their rights and uh, try to push children and girls to accept as much as they say and the things they say to them, it will be very difficult. And the, the result will be very negative after a few years. We have to be care about these things, who is teaching them because a lot of teachers left the country. And, uh, the, and the many of uh, areas in the rural area, we don't have even uh, female teacher in the past as well. Now, this problem will increase because of the insecurity and some other problems which people think they are under pressure and they, are, they have not that much uh, freedom and safety, and it will make a lot of problems in the future as well. Thank you. I think we have time for just one more uh, quick. Sure. Q &A. This question is specifically on financing and resourcing, asking, you know, Spojmai's uh, recommendation about buy-in for the Taliban being critical might be a far off goal. What can we do in the immediate term as donors uh, to make sure that we are effectively getting resourcing where it needs to go while also not undermining the Taliban's role? Anyone on that one? Uh, Spojmai, you خب اگر فکر بکنیم که بتونیم کمک ها را ما قبلا هم در یک اعلامیه که در سخاندم این ای بود که بتونیم کمک ها را از طریق زن ها و از از زن ها بخوایم از طریق نهاد های زنان بخوایم از طریق نهاد های بین المللی بخوایم که این کمک ها توضیح بکنن ما در همین شش ما کمک های بیشماری برای افغانستان داخل شده و کمک های بیشماری از تمام کشورها وارد کابل و افغانستان شده اما وقتی وارد می شود دیگر مشخص نیست که کجا می و به کجا به کی توضیح می شود بر ما پیام های زیادی می رسیده مثلا از قسمت غرب کابل از قسمت شمال کابل که این کمک ها به طور ناعادلانه توضیح می شود مثلا یک خانواده به طور خیلی شفاف این کمک ها را میگیره و به یک خانواده اصلا نمیرسه و تذکره ها پول ها و تذکره ها و نام ها جمع می شود و به اونا وعده های کاذب داده می شود که این هفته یا هفته آینده یا ماه های آینده این کمک ها به شما می رسه همین هفته های گذشته در پروان بیش از سه هزار تذکره جمع شد که بتانن از طریق شماره های تذکره به خانواده ها کمک ها توضیح بکنن اما تقریبا در دونی ماه گذشته هم چون یک اتفاق افتاده بود که این انوز در از همون دونی ما انوز هیچ کمک به مردم پروان به مردم بدخشان به مردم سمنگان به مردم دشت برچی در قسمت غرب کابل و سایر ولایت هایی که در ننگرهار و جلال آباد و اینا هست هیچ کمک وارد نشده و اصلا مشخص نیست وقتی که این کمک ها وارد افغانستان می شود به کجا می روند 
ما حتی خانواده های رم داریم که شما دیدیم که گرده هاشان به فروش گذاشتن و ایده از خانواده های رم داریم که فرزندان خودشان به خاطر زنده ماندن اعضای خانواده شان به فروش گذاشتن و حتی خانواده هایی که وسایل خانه چیز نیازمندی هایی که در خانه برای فعلا نیاز نداشتن به فروش گذاشتن تا بتوانند این برای تامین نفس خود و یا تامین زندگی خود ای زنده, زنده بمانند اما ما به این فکر هستم که این کمک ها را بیاین از طریق خانم ها برای خانم ها و برای مردم برسانیم ما نهادهای کوچک و بزرگی داریم که شما میتونید با اونا کانتکت شوید و این هم زمینه کار برای زن ها باز میکنه ما میتونیم از سه زاویه یا چهار زاویه ای را ببینیم هم اشغال و کار برای زن ها و باز شدن نهادهای زن ها که مربوط برای زن ها است باز میشه و این کارا کارا را می توانند با کمک های که توضیح می کنند با کمک هایی که به مردم می رسانند با زن ها فعالیتشان آغاز بکنند و هم این کمک ها به طور عادلانه برسن مگر اینکه این که این, این کمک ها را نه تنها برای اینکه ارسال بکنیم از کسایی که این کمک ها را به اونا می دیم مثلا مربوط نهاد هایی می شه که زن ها ای را در رست این, این نهاد ها هست از اونا بخواهید و ما گزارش تهیه بکنند یعنی وقتی کمکی را برای یک زن و برای یک نهاد می دیم این فراموش نکنیم که برای آره ای زن این کمک ها را توضیح کرده نه خیر سر همون تاریخی که این کمک ها را می دیم تاریخ مشخص قرار باشه برایش تعیین بکنیم که این کمک کار گزارش مفصل و شفافی برای ما داشته باشه که واقعا بفهمیم این کمک به این پولی که ما روان میکنیم به کجا میرسن آیا به جیب یک نفر پایین میشود یا واقعا ایده ای از مردم فقیری که در افغانستان هست اینا را میتونه گرداگر در بر بگیره پس چه خوب است که این کمک ها را از نهاد زن ها برای زن ها و برای مردم اجرا بکنیم و بتانیم با این کمک ها با این فشار ها بالای طالبان و کمک خواستن از زن ها فعالیت های زن ها را داشته باشیم کار برای نهاد زن ها هم باز شود زن ها هم مشغول شوند و هم طالبان کمک هایی که غیر عادلانه میرسه از طریق طالبان متوقف شده و به طور عادلانه هم به پایتخت و شهرهای مرکز و هم به روستاهایی که مردم نیازمند و مردم داره از گرسنگی میمره و فرق بی اندازه زیاد شده و مردم دست به فروش گرده و فروش کودکشان زده همرسانی بکنیم و از اینا بخوایم در قبال این کمک ها یک کاری را انجام بدن که دست yeah. دست گدای oh, sure. من افغانستان کوتا شود یعنی درست است که ما پول میدیم شاید یک ماه یا دو ماه را در بر بگیره و در بر گیرنده 20 یا 25 روز باشه یک, یک مقدار پولی که ما بینا کمیدیم خب بعد, بعد از دو ماه باز هم همون گرسنه ای است که دو ماه قبل بود چه خوب است که بخوایم از این کمک ها استفاده گسترده استفاده بزرگی داشته باشیم از اونا بخوایم یک کاری بکنن که در قبالش پول پرداخت بکنیم و مگر اینکه ایده ای از خانواده که واقعا نیاز دارن که یک مقدار تامین شوند تامین زندگی برایشان شود یک ماه دو ماهی که اونا بتانن روی پای استاده شوند ممنون Thank you very much Khoda and um, we have we have we have even gone a little bit over time so we're going to have to bring this to a close uh, but I want to thank Ambassador Rahmani, to Khoda, to Najiba, uh, to Sponjai, Mai, and to Heather uh, for illuminating uh, the realities of uh, human rights violations ongoing uh, in Afghanistan and in fact escalating in many, many instances. Uh, we need to continue a focus on this and we need to address it. Uh, and many good actions were recommended. I want to close the way uh, Ambassador Rahmani opened uh, because she said that we must not lower the bar on human rights, especially women's rights. And I think uh, that is wisdom well taken. Uh, and to further quote her, 
uh, where there is will, there is way. Uh, and we have certainly heard ways today that should be pursued uh, to really take action on these very, very important issues. So thank you all for helping us um, address this topic, but even more importantly, uh, the work that needs to go on uh, to ensure that these kinds of terrible violations uh, can be uh, brought to an end. Thank you all.